I dreamed of it when I got drafted here. I looked all those stats up and was like, man, I want to break all these, you know, um, as a competitor, but I'm sick of losing. Like, I'm going to be completely honest with you, I'm tired of being disrespected. So uh, there was no question I was going to play this year. We are now the Las Vegas Raiders. It's time now for another episode of Vegas Nation Blitz. Welcome in, everyone. I am your host, Cassie Soto. The Raiders are now 2-2 two and two on the season after falling to the still-undefeated Buffalo Bills 30 to 23 here to help us break down that loss is Raiders beat writer for the Las Vegas Review Journal, Vinny Bonsignor. Vinny, I know the difference in the score was just seven, but I don't know about you, but it felt like a whole heck of a lot more to me. It did and it didn't. Uh, by no means does, do, the, do the Raiders believe that they can't compete with the Buffalo Bills. They certainly can. Uh, they were able to move the ball. Uh, you know, when they weren't shooting themselves in, in the foot, they were moving the ball just as they have been pretty much all year. So they feel good about where they are offensively if they can just cut down on the mistakes that have plagued them the last two weeks. If so, they're in line to score 30 points uh, uh, pretty easily these last couple of weeks, which would put them in a very competitive position. Where the, the, the real concern is is defensively right now. They just cannot get turnovers. They can't create pressure on opposing quarterbacks. They're giving up too many points. Uh, they're not getting off the field enough. Um, so... You know, if you if because of that, the the offense feels like it has to play, you know, it doesn't feel like, but the, the offense has to play pretty much perfect football, and that's just not sustainable. So you can't be in a situation where one turnover is going to be the killer of, of the game. Your defense needs to be able to, you know, lend a bigger hand than that. Well, we know the defense obviously played a huge part in this loss. They gave up 30 points. But I want to ask you, Vinny, in your opinion, do you feel that, and a lot of people you know, are thinking the same way, is Derek Carr playing too conservative so far this season? Uh, I mean, Derek's on pace for a career year, including his, the, the, uh, uh, you know, his average per throw. So it's over eight, uh, which is, it would be a career high. No, I think he's doing fine, actually. Uh, I think he's taking chances downfield. You saw the touchdown pass to Nelson Aguilar. People have pointed out that I respect on Twitter that that flag should not have happened. Uh, the Raiders were in uh, a legal formation on an illegal formation. So that changes things on his statistics a little bit more. But, I mean, he's having a really good year. It's not Derek Carr's fault that, you know, they've lost the last two games. Yes, he did fumble uh, twice. But, you know, even on those, when you have the pocket collapsing against you and, and there's just like a big party uh, at your foot, at your, at your front door, it's hard sometimes to be able to escape that. And even if you do, you're leaving yourself vulnerable to fumbles. And that's exactly what happens. So, no, the issue isn't him. The issue is a, a defense that can't stop anybody, uh, penalties and, and, you know, just too many turnovers that can't happen when your defense is playing as badly as the Raiders defense is right now. Would you say, Vinny, that this win is more attributed to the B the Bills playing good football or the Raiders, as you said it, shooting themselves in the foot? Because there were some big missed opportunities there for the Silver and Black. Yeah, um, I, I think that obviously the Bills are, are a really good team. But that's the encouraging thing if you're a Raiders fan. Uh, short of making a couple of costly mistakes, they're in that game. They're, I mean, it was 17-16, to 16, and they're driving to take the lead when Darren Waller fumbles in Bill's territory. I mean, that changes the whole game right there. Uh, and then, what, just a few plays later, the Bills score a touchdown, uh, you know, to, to, to take a bigger lead. And then they added another touchdown after the turnover uh, by Derek Carr. So it's two quick mistakes like that that all of a sudden, you know, the game is completely different. So, um, you know, you have to keep that in perspective. Yes, the Bills are a good team, but the Raiders are not far off. They're, they're actually really good offensively right now, even without a great running game, which figures to get better once they get healthy. Uh, and again, let's remind ourselves, they're doing this without their top three wide receivers coming into the season. Tyrell Williams, or three of their top wide receivers, Tyrell Williams, Henry Ruggs, now Brian Edwards is out as well. Get those guys back, get Trent Brown back, get Rick, Richie Incognito back. And the offense is going to be fine. Where are the, Where's the help, though, going to come defensively? That's the big issue. All right, well, we will see what happens heading into week five now. The Raiders will head to face the mighty, mighty Kansas City Chiefs. Vinny, thank you so much for the updates as always. In other news, Raiders defensive tackle Maurice Hurst has been placed on the NFL's COVID-19 reserve list. 
Bill O'Brien was fired Monday as the head coach and general manager of the winless Houston Texans. And the Cleveland Browns said running back Nick Chubb will miss several weeks because of a knee injury. Let's go ahead and check in now on the Raiders social media front with Las Vegas Review Journal sports journalist Le'Andre Fox. Le'Andre teams coming into Vegas are continuing to keep up with the Vegas references. And we know this time uh, it was unfortunate because the Raiders lost to the team coming in, lost to the Bills 30 to 23. So we got to give them some props there. First loss at Allegiant Stadium. It's one of the last firsts we're going to get from that stadium, honestly. And Stefan Diggs came through with the hangover cleats. I don't think he met a Tiger. I don't think he met Mike Tyson. I don't think he got into a bunch of shenanigans. I'm pretty sure they went on a plane and got right back to Buffalo. But he had a pretty good highlight catch over Eric Harris. So I think it evens out. <laughs> good for Stephon Diggs. Bad for the Raiders there on that highlight reel. Sure. Let's go ahead now. We'll move on to the Raiders. Jalen Richard, Raiders running back. He's got a pretty big fan that might surprise some people. Adam Hill on Vegas Nation Game Day said that he saw Jalen Richard hanging out with Flavor Flav. So they're friends. But I didn't think it was this far to where Flavor Flav has Jalen Richard's nickname on the back of his jersey. And he's hanging out outside Allegiant Stadium. I don't know exactly what he's doing if he just went there for a photo op for the opportunity to show off the fact that he has this jersey and that he had it made for him. But, hey, if Flav's a Raider fan, Raider Nation, embrace it. <laughs> well, speaking of some big-time fans, we've got another Raiders fan who was pretty heartbroken, uh, Dre, by the Raiders' loss on Sunday. Dame Dalla, Dame Lillard. He is an Oakland native. He has a Raider tattoo. He is a proud member of Raider Nation. But at some point during that game on Sunday, he had had enough. He tweeted out, oh, my God, bro, which started the trolls. The trolls started coming in in his mentions. A Kansas City fan said, hey, we're going to see you next week. And Dame said, I am not going to watch that game. Hopefully the Raiders can get it together and slow down Patrick Mahomes and that dynamic Chiefs offense just enough to where Dan can still enjoy that game and hopefully they come away with a win. Hopefully we'll see what the Raiders can pull off for Dame Lillard and the rest of Raider Nation. Dre, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. We are going to take a quick break, but we will be right back. Stay with us. Raiders legend Howie Long co-starred in what John Travolta film? Was it A, Broken Arrow, B, Face Off, C, Get Shorty, or D, Pulp Fiction? Stay on the winning page with fan fave Las Vegas Review Journal. To receive Vegas Nation content, plus breaking news, local entertainment, and lifestyle coverage. For only 99 cents a week, you'll get home delivery plus unlimited access to LVRJ.com. However you like it, whenever you like it. Award-winning content, all at your fingertips. Subscribe today at MyLVRJ.com backslash superfan. Get the Vegas Nation podcast three days a week. All things Raiders, all week long. The Vegas Nation podcast, powered by the Las Vegas Review Journal. Now three days a week, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Raiders analysis. Mark Davis looking out for the fans. Interviews. How do you look at this season coming up? I'm going to be a much better player. NFL talk. These couples are not a legit well, contender paper, either. They are, my friend. Uh, they're not. Find all our podcasts on VegasNation.com and hit subscribe. Raiders, fast takes, smart coverage. Thanks so much for tuning back into Vegas Nation Blitz. I'm your host, Cassie Soto. Well, we knew it would happen, and it did. The NFL has fined Raiders tight end Darren Waller, as well as several of his teammates after they were seen on video not wearing masks at a charity event put on by Waller himself. Here to tell us a little bit more about it is Las Vegas Review Journal sports columnist, Ed Graney, Ed Waller took the biggest hit out of everybody. He was faced with a $30,000 fine. His teammates, $15,000 a piece. Is this what we expected would happen? Well, I thought they'd get fined. I actually thought early on it was the team that fined the players because the league finds the owners and coaches like Gruden got fined on the team when he wouldn't wear the mask. But it ended up being the league finding them. I know there's a, an appellate process where they can appeal this. I kind of hope they don't for a few reasons. One, you were caught without the masks. It was your video that kind of showed it. I don't think you should. I mean, I understand appealing anything. I usually am behind a appeal everything. You never know. But in this instance, what I'd like to see them do, led by Derek Carr, is um, all these fines, if you didn't know this, these fines that guys get fined all the year, they always go to charity. 
That's what the league does. The league doesn't keep the money. So if I'm, Darren, uh, if I'm Derek Carr, I call Roger Goodell or whoever handles this and says, look, we'll pay it all. Let's put the money back into Darren's foundation. Because, because you know, when, when Darren uh, lost his money, uh, it takes off what he had earned. So that's what I'd like to see happen. I think it would. The league, I think, would be fine with that. I don't know why they wouldn't. They give it a charity anyway. So if I'm those guys, instead of appealing, which I think their agents will have them do just because you, want, you don't want to set precedent, I would say we'll, fight, we'll pay it, and then we want the money going back to uh, Darren Waller's foundation. Yeah, well, that would be definitely a great cause there. Um, well, the announcement, Ed, came the exact same day that the NFL sent out a memo saying that events like this, like Waller's charity event, are completely off limits. We know, obviously, teams can face fines. They can even lose draft picks. But now we're also hearing that teams can also face forfeiting games. Are the Raiders on pretty thin ice now after everything that they've been through just four, four or five weeks into the NFL season? Yeah, more than most people, probably more than anyone. You know what the amazing thing about this, Cassie, is? They've been by far, by far the worst handling this, and yet they've never had a positive test. So you and I should feel really good because we're tested by the same people, so that's awesome. But I'm actually shocked, given how poorly they've handled this, that there's been no positive tests. Yeah, I mean, forfeiture of a game would be huge. I've heard sometimes you, maybe they'll take the head coach away. If that's true, Greg Olson, the offensive coordinator, would call for 155 passes that night, all of which would be beyond 10 yards. So we'd finally see deep balls. Uh, but I think forfeiture game, you really are going to have to like laugh in the NFL's face and say, look, we don't care. We don't care about this. I think that's the last uh, straw. A draft pick, though, in the fifth or sixth round, I think the Raiders are closer to that than they want to be. Yeah, well, as if the Raiders did not have enough to worry about, Ed, they are heading to Arrowhead Stadium this week to face the still undefeated Kansas City Chiefs. Do they stand any chance at all in this game, Ed? I, I mean, the Chiefs are coming in on a short week, but still, do the Raiders put up any amount of points on this team? Yeah, I'm going to wake up six foot six tomorrow. No, I'm not. Um, but look, you always stand a chance, right? I mean, last night I threw it. Now, they're not the Patriots. I get that defensively. But you go in, maybe get a few fumbles. The one thing that Raiders have to do is finally, I don't know when the last time they did this, is win the turnover battle you got to get an interception to Mahomes. You have to tip a ball. You have to get a fumble like the Patriots did last night. And then keep Mahomes off the field. If you can get turnovers and you can't have one of those classic Gruden drives of 15 plays that he loves, you're in it. I don't know if you win it, but you're in it. So, no. I mean, if you look at the odds and the history, the chances are very, very slim that they would go there and win. All right. Well, with that being said, the Raiders will probably be two and three heading into their bye week. Ed, what changes immediately have to be fixed as they get ready to host Tom Brady and the Buccaneers in week seven? Yeah, the changes are what they've always been is they have to be better defensively. Uh, they're 29th in most categories out of 32. Are they, can they improve enough to get in the mid 20s this year? I don't know. They're just not very good defensively. They have no pass rush. And with guys like Mahomes and Brady, and we saw with Josh Allen, if you don't have a pass rush, you're going to get drilled in that league. And Cassie, I don't know if they have guys. Max Crosby last year, he's not having a good year. Cleland Farrell, they're playing him inside, you know, as well. You don't get sacks that way. So I don't know what the – Corey Littleton's got to play better at linebacker. I think Nick, Nick Witowski coming back is going to help him a little. If, the, if your question is what it is they have to do, it's get better defensively. But you know what? It's a broken record. You and I have talked about this. It's every week like this for three years. So – We'll see if they can do it, but that's what they have to do if they want to be in line for a wild card spot later in the year. All right, well, it'll be a rough next few weeks for the Raiders, Ed. We'll see what happens. Thank you so much, as always. All right, Cassie. We are going to take a quick break, but we will be right back. Don't go anywhere. The answer is A, Broken Arrow, the Hall of Famer and Fox NFL analyst, has also appeared in films such as Firestorm and 3,000 Miles to Graceland. Welcome back to the Vegas Nation Blitz. It's your podcast host here, Heidi Fang, along with our NFL writer, Adam Hill. We're going to break down what's happening here in the AFC West. The Kansas City Chiefs played Monday Night Football and remain undefeated now at 4-0, heading into a kind of short week for them. Adam, do you think that this team can remain undefeated down the stretch? We're going to see them probably remain undefeated until they beat themselves at some point, and this is going to be a stretch to test them. As you mentioned, the game Monday was moved uh, back in day because of coronavirus positive tests. You've got the game coming up Sunday uh, against the Raiders, and then a Thursday night showdown against the undefeated Bills. Uh, that will be a real test to try to get all those games turned around in that amount of time. We'll see if the league does anything, maybe move that Thursday game back a few days. 
But we don't know what's going to go on. The Bills game against the Titans is in question this week as well. So there's a lot of moving pieces. If they do play those three games in 11 days, that will be a huge test for the Chiefs. But I think they stay undefeated until they do something to beat themselves. What stood out to you this week in play with the AFC West teams? Well, I think you see the continued injury situations that are developing. Apart from the Chiefs, you've got a Denver Broncos team that is completely decimated with injuries. They came through uh, with a big effort last Thursday, but that's against the Jets. The Raiders have all kinds of injury concerns uh, here at this facility right behind us. There's guys in treatment all over the place. And then the Chargers just keep having guys go out. Austin Eckler, now the latest victim uh, to be down for several weeks. They've not won a game uh, since Tyrod Taylor got hurt. I know a lot of people are salivating over what Justin Herbert is doing down there, but they have not won a game, and now they've got another tough matchup against the Saints coming up this week. Uh, so it's the injuries all over the division, except for the Chiefs. The Chiefs don't need any help to win this division, but they're getting everything that they possibly could need. Well, lastly, what are you looking forward to most here as we pull ahead to week five? Justin Herbert and the Chargers going to New Orleans to play the Saints on Monday Night Football. I think that's a big one. Again, Justin Herbert is doing a lot of good things, has not won a game yet, and people are wondering why Anthony Lynn is so slow to embrace him because the little things that he has to do to win, he's not doing. So as good as the talent is, as impressive as he's looked uh, from a fantasy football perspective, hasn't done those things to get the win. So we'll see if he can do that, take that next step. Another tough matchup for the Chargers against the, against the Saints this week. I'm on a night football. As we've been talking here about AFC West teams, it's time to look at a running back who played for both the Raiders and the Chiefs in this moment in Raiders history as we flash back on Marcus Allen's career. Throughout the Raiders' storied history, many players have played for other teams before or after their tenure with the Raiders. One such player was Hall of Fame running back Marcus Allen. Allen's run with the Raiders started in 1982 when he was selected in the first round of the draft out of USC. The Raiders took the Heisman Trophy winner at the number 10 spot overall. He had an immediate impact on the Los Angeles team that went to the divisional playoffs, and despite playing in a shortened season due to a strike in his rookie year, he still set a record for the franchise for most rushing yards by a rookie was 697 yards. That record was not broken until Josh Jacobs came along in 2019. At Super Bowl 18 on January 22, 1984, Marcus Allen had over 200 yards from scrimmage and scored two touchdowns in the Raiders 38-9 victory over the Washington Redskins. Allen would start sharing the backfield with Bo Jackson in 1987. It's no secret that he and Al Davis had a stormy relationship stemming from a contract dispute. It hit a breaking point in 1992 when Allen told Al Michaels in an interview that he thought Davis was out to get him and to prevent him from having a Hall of Fame career. In 1993, the 33-year-old Allen became a free agent and went to sign with the Kansas City Chiefs. He led the AFC with 12 touchdowns that season and played in the AFC Championship game. Following the season, he was named Comeback Player of the Year. In his 16 seasons played, he was a six-time Pro Bowler, a Super Bowl, and NFL MVP among his many achievements. And that'll do it for this moment in Raiders history. We'll be back next week. Stay on the winning page with Fan Fave Las Vegas Review Journal. To receive Vegas Nation content, plus breaking news, local entertainment, and lifestyle coverage, for only 99 cents a week, you'll get home delivery plus unlimited access to LVRJ.com. However you like it, whenever you like it. Award-winning content, all at your fingertips. Subscribe today at MyLVRJ.com backslash superfan. Get the Vegas Nation podcast three days a week. All things Raiders, all week long. The Vegas Nation podcast, powered by the Las Vegas Review Journal. Now three days a week, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Raiders analysis. Mark Davis looking out for the fans. Interviews. How do you look at this season coming up? I'm going to be a much better player. NFL talk. These Cowboys are not a legit well, contender paper, either. They are, my friend. Uh, they're not. Find all our podcasts on VegasNation.com and hit subscribe. Raiders, fast takes, smart coverage. The current limit, limit on public and private gatherings is capped at 50 people, 5-0. We have now increased the limit on public and private gatherings to 250 people, or 50% of the capacity, whichever is less. If a, ven a larger venue defined as having more than 2,500 fixed seating capacity wishes to host more than, 25, more than 250 people, and can meet the extensive requirements necessary to host a gathering, they can host a gathering of up to 10% of their total fixed seating capacity. 
You just heard from Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak as he announced that facilities with a capacity over 2,500 could potentially host up to 10% of their total capacity if they follow some pretty strict guidelines. That, of course, includes Allegiant Stadium. Here to tell us more about that is Allegiant Stadium insider Mick Akers. Mick, can you please break down the governor's new directive and how it could see fans inside of Allegiant Stadium? Yeah, so obviously, since, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, no one's been allowed in, you know, large gatherings and such. So obviously, with his upping of the, hey, say 10% can go inside of, you know, buildings of 2,500 fixed seats or more. So Allegiant Stadium has 65,000. So that's 6,500 seats that, you know, fans can fill in for events this year. Uh, so they would have to follow some strict guidelines, um, no more than 250 people in each section. Obviously, Allegiant has tons of sections. So, you know, not, not an issue there. They have to have, you know, some pretty aggressive uh signage barriers and all that just to you know no hey this is not a good section to sit in you can't sit here um blocking off i, I would imagine between lines for concessions they're going to have some kind of barriers up between those you know keeping people you know distance as much as they could so obviously you know it opens up the possibility of fans at um, allegiant this year which a lot of people didn't think was going to be possible and of course with other venues around town you know team Marina, marina thomas and mac and all those well we know that the that allegiant stadium is home to the raiders but it is also home to the UNLV Rebels, and they have a big supporter, the Re the Rebels do, from the Raiders saying, hey, if they have fans, we're cool with it. Yeah, so, um, you know, initially when people started hearing the rumblings that, hey, maybe we might be able to get some fans in, uh, a lot of people thought the Raiders might, you know, try to block that because obviously they want to have, you know, the first fans in there and such, and that was some, some of the murmurs going around social media over the last couple of weeks. But, hey, Mark Davis, the owner of the Raiders, comes out and says we're supportive of it. Um, you know, it's not only beneficial for, you know, V to have some fans, so the, the community to have people go in and check out the stadium finally. And then it's also beneficial to some of the stadium workers. You know, they haven't had any real life experience with, you know, the stadium yet. So get some people in, get those concession stands working, um, you know, have some real life, you know, fans in there and see how operations go, get it ready, you know, whenever they can have 65,000 people in there. So, you know, Davis and the Raiders are behind this and they're hoping that the state, you know, allows you know, be to do that because they submitted their plan already. And, you know, what a better game to do that against Reno, you know, on Nevada Day. So you know, that means like the perfect first fan event, I think, at the stadium, you know, outside of a Raiders event. Well, we know Mark Davis is obviously a big fan now cheering for UNLV to have fans, but is he still stuck on if one fan can't get in, no fans are getting in? Will the Raiders have any fans in Allegiant Stadium this season? No, he, he's still, you know, sticking to his guns on that. Uh, He's, I asked him that again. He's like, no, it's it's all or none for us. Um, don't want to single out any of the sold out, you know, fans. Obviously, all 65,000 seats sold out, which surprised a lot of people. He he did tell me, you know, outside chance if they make the playoffs, maybe, you know, you see what happens that, at that point. But, you know, as far as regular season, no fans. Well, Raiders fans might be conver converting to Rebels fans here soon, Mick. Thank you so much for the updates. Thanks, Cassie. Well, that will do it for another episode of Vegas Nation Blitz. As always, we hope you're enjoying our content. So be sure to tune in with us on Sundays, every Sunday at 9 a.m. on Cox Your View Channel 14, as well as the Vegas Nation Facebook page for our Vegas Nation game day show, where we break down everything you need to know about the Raiders and their opponent that week. That's Vegas Nation game day, Cox Your View Channel 14 at 9 a.m. on Sundays. For our Vegas Nation crew, I'm Cassie Soto. We'll see you next week. We'll